I have a tradition on this channel where every December I run through my favorite anime that I watched that year, usually as one big video, and one time as a whole lot of little ones. This year we're doing the one big video again, as you can tell, but instead of just running through my 10 favorite like normal, instead I'm going to be talking about all the anime I watched in 2019, excluding rewatches, and telling you which of those were my favorites only at the very end. I'll be talking about these anime roughly in the order I completed them in, and I'll try to limit to myself to about 500 words per entry. So this'll be like 31 days of anime 2017 except all in one video and not as many. Just a bunch of little anime reviews. Hopefully in the course of these many minutes I'll talk about something that sparks your interest. Well, I think that's enough introduction. Any questions? Uh, yes, um, are you- Great, let's get started! Before we get to any of the new stuff, I want to quickly recap the anime I've already made videos about this year for the sake of completion and so I don't spend too much time retreading old ground. I'm already breaking the chronological order I just said we'd be going through here, but eh, whatever. First off, pre -Kir. I watched and made videos about four seasons, Smile, Doki Doki, Happiness Charge, and Go Princess, and of those four, Go Princess was the strongest, Happiness Charge was the weakest, and the other two were really fun in their own ways. I made a video about the fourth season of Symphogear, which continues to be an exciting romp whose fifth season I still need to get around to, My Hime was an alright show with some yikes, Alien 9 was a surprisingly excellent little sci-fi OVA, the Rising of the Shield hero was... <sighs> I regret that video, to be honest. Don't want to linger, but suffice to say, that show has some big yikes going on that I shamefully underplayed. Apologies. Probably should unlist that one. Last recap, Fushigi Maho Fun Fun Pharmacy, a fun 90s magical girl series, and that's all the stuff I've already discussed on this channel this year. Now, on to the new stuff. The first anime I completed this year was a Netflix original called Children of the Whales. I started it on January 1st and finished it on January 8th, and because that was so long ago, to be honest, I don't really have any strong opinions about it anymore. The only thing that left a lasting impact was its visual presentation. Between the stellar character designs, gorgeous background art, and frequent energetic animation, I was stunned to learn that this was a JC staff production. There was plenty to latch onto narrative-wise. The show set up high stakes early on with the death of a seemingly prominent character, and an awful lot of fascinating world-building tidbits were packed into the show's 12-episode run. However, the show being only 12 episodes really hurt its staying power. It was based on a manga that is still ongoing, and given that the anime covered comparatively little of it, and that there's no news of a second season two years later, all that we're left with is setup and teasing for a much larger story that anime-only viewers will never get to see, leaving the anime itself as an incomplete and unsatisfying package. I can say that's the case because despite less than a year having passed since I watched this show, I could not recount to you enough story details to give you a good understanding of what the show was about without looking up a plot synopsis on Wikipedia. Shit, I couldn't even tell you what any of the characters' names are. Some things did stick with me. I recalled that the show opened on a funeral, which worked to establish the setting, that being an island in a sea of sand on which some magic folk work to suppress their emotions, I think? I guess that's a good hook. I remember this cool, aloof troublemaker who often got locked up but was good at fighting. I recall that as the show went on, it slowly revealed more about the nature of the world, such as the fact that the island is actually an old penal colony, and that some empire that rules the outside world ain't too happy that they're still around. What I'm trying to say is that me being able to remember those parts but not the whole is evidence that this is a competently made show with cool ideas and a solid presentation that by all rights should be excellent, but because it was only ever allowed to tell a small part of a larger narrative, it ended up lacking some crucial elements that would have given it more staying power. In short, it's a well-made show that I don't recall having glaring faults, just there was far too little of it for it to truly make an impact on me, and that's a darn shame. Next up is the final film in the animated Godzilla trilogy on Netflix, and since I've never discussed any of these movies, i discussed the whole trilogy here. As a whole, this trilogy is... underwhelming. 
You'd think a series of Godzilla movies written by the Aura Butcher himself and animated at Polygon Studios would have a bit more dramatic flair to it, but alas. Earwax. I believe I have the exact opposite opinions of the rest of the internet about which of these movies are the best, at least according to the MAL rankings, where I liked the third film the best and the second the least, the MAL Collective holds the inverse opinion. The second part has a cool concept, sure, a whole city that has grown from and essentially is Mecha Godzilla, but what does it do with that concept? To my admittedly lackluster recollection, not much. I recall being intrigued by the third film's take on King Ghidorah, rather than just being some big three-headed dragon thing which screams and fights the big G-man. It's instead some unknowable extraterrestrial being, a force of nature beyond our understanding. All we can know about it is that it destroys. It's a sort of Lovecraftian horror that can't really be beaten so much as survived, and survival can only be attained through the collaboration and camaraderie of what remains of humanity. Much of the trilogy was dedicated to the anger of the main character, Haruro Sakaki. His anger at Godzilla for taking his home and his people, his anger at others and at himself for being unable to really fight back. All that anger was an isolating force, and he had to let go of it in order to truly connect again with his fellow people, I think. Guys, it's been like almost a year, I'm struggling to remember this shit. As a whole, the trilogy feels over-reliant on an excess of underdeveloped concepts, but unlike Children of the Whales, it at least managed to tell a whole story within its allotted runtime. One thing I can say for certain about these films is that the first film's fantastic cliffhanger ending pretty much justifies the whole trilogy's existence. So the humans spent the whole movie fighting Godzilla, right? They've lost people, they've been mad, and they enacted this whole mad scheme that could have gone wrong at any moment, but through hard work and perseverance and luck, they managed to pull it off and defeat Godzilla. It's lying dead at the foot of a mountain, everyone gathers around and cheers and is happy, and then the mountain stands up. That's the real Godzilla, baby, and boy is he big and mad. Great cliffhanger to end on, too. Too bad nothing that followed lived up to it. Fate Stay Night, Heaven's Field 2, Lost Butterfly, was, simply put, pretty fucking dope. Pop quiz, have you ever seen a scene... I didn't even realize I wrote that like that. Have you seen a scene? Oops. Have you ever seen a scene in any movie or TV show where all a character did was slowly walk forward? And if so, was that scene also one of the most visually stunning and emotionally gripping scenes you ever done seen? Well, I have, and it was right here in this movie. The best animated adaptations of the Fate franchise, all two of them, have always been beautiful to look at and have had something to grip you narratively. Fate Zero, building from the inherently intoxicating premise of the Holy Grail War, managed to weave together a tapestry of character and thematic explorations from a young mage desperately trying to carve a place for himself in a world that's against him, to kings from across the ages debating the right way to rule. Heaven's Feel, meanwhile, has Sakura Mato, a character with a singular level of emotional depth not present anywhere else in the franchise. The story of Sakura Mato is a tragedy. It's a story of a woman who's been controlled and possessed all of her life, robbed of any agency, desperately seeking out a place in the world and any sense of self-worth. It's harrowing watching her go through as much as she does, her nearly giving up and living on despite everything. As an audience member, I want nothing more than to see her pull through, and even if I want to, I can't tear my eyes away from the screen as Sakura descends deeper into a hell built for her wittingly or not, by all the worst actors in her life. I think it's a testament to the writing of Heaven's Feel that, despite all the horrible shit that's happened to her, I'm more invested in seeing Sakura's story through to the end than I have been in any other 
part of the Fate franchise. Though, I swear to God, if all of that buildup is just going to be capped off with, and then Shiro saved the day, I am going to be so pissed off. Though I would be remiss not to mention that the story's ability to grip is helped along in no small part by the excellent presentation crafted by director Tomonori Sudo and the staff at Studio Fotable. As we saw with the just walking forward scene from earlier, Sudo's gripping direction from the blocking of a scene to the framing of the characters, Yuki Kajiura's always resonant soundtrack, and the detailed layered animation crafted by the animation staff all coalesce into a cinematic feast that elevates the source material far beyond what I thought possible. This film is bar none the best thing to come out of the franchise since Fate Zero, and I am so very stoked for the third film. A shame about that tax evasion, though. Guess they're going to jail with Yoshi. <laughs> Next up is an odd little Netflix original called Ico Incarnation. Ico is a wacky little sci-fi romp that I'm honestly not quite too sure what to make of. Unlike Children of the Whales, however, it did have enough staying power for me to provide a little synopsis of memory. Humanity is slowly retreating from, or holding back, this questionably sentient blob of living tissue called matter. Pretty much, what if Akira, but too much. The main character, Aiko Tachibana, lives in a hospital recovering from some injury she got when the matter started taking over and is trying to live a regular school life sans one dead family when a cute boy comes along it kidnaps her, takes her to the base of some underground group, and reveals the truth. Turns out her body is a clone body created from the matter, I think? She's told that she's still the original her with her original brain, but her body's a clone and her original body is at ground zero of the disaster, and that in order to stop it all, they gotta go there and swap her back in, and in order to do that, they're gonna be escorted by people in multi colored power suits who apparently fight their way through the matter for a living and then in the background there's conspiracies boiling about what's really going on and grabs for power by all sorts of factions and stuff like that <sighs> did you get all that it, it only gets weirder from there Despite this show being as out there as it is, it's actually not only watchable, but serviceably gripping on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. Individual plot beats usually work well enough on their own, even if a lot of the forces in the background, government agencies and what have you, are a bit confused and underdeveloped in their motivations and goals. A lot of the moment-to-moment -moment stuff is helped along by having a relatively compelling protagonist in Aiko Tachibana. She's thrust into a crazy situation and has to mature as the story plays out, even having to face a difficult moral dilemma by the end and demonstrating newfound maturity with her choice, it's good stuff. This show is also an easy watch thanks to its visual presentation. It should come as no surprise given that it's a Bones original. There's a lot of kinetic and exciting animation, obviously, but for some reason I really dug the character designs and for the life of me I cannot tell you why, just they look nice. It's nice, okay? The show is nice. It can get a little nonsensical at times, but is usually an intriguing enough ride, and I think the ending was genuinely conceptually fascinating and pretty well executed to boot. I wouldn't advise you to put this high on your priority list, but if you're ever in the mood for something a little weird, put this one on maybe. Sun Guts No Lion, or March Comes In Like a Lion, was perhaps my hardest watch all year. This show was such an immaculate exploration of depression and isolation that a lot of its most powerful moments just hurt. Of all the anime I watched this year, Sangatsu no Lion was one of only two that made me cry. Sangatsu no Lion is about Rei Kiriyama, a professional shogi player whose immersion in the game has left him feeling alone and empty, and the Kawamoto family. Sisters Akari, Hinata, and Momo, who run a sweet shop, have their own little life and school troubles, and slowly become sort of like a family today. Sangat Snow Lion can be both blunt and delicate in its tackling of its various themes, and there's a sort of woeful beauty to that, helped along in no small part thanks to its very shaft presentation. Just look at the opening scene. 
deafening ambient noise drowned out by the taunts of the woman who most hates Ray, the harsh black and white inking of Ray almost causing him to blend into the background, into nothing, while the woman says there's no place for him, contrasting heavily with imagery that evokes sinking in water, drowning, being unable to swim. It's just a dream, a nightmare that he wakes numb from. It's one he's had before, and it's one that reflects Ray's waking reality. He feels invisible, isolated, alone in the world, despite its overwhelming brightness, despite all the people who are, in reality, there for him. Ray's journey over the course of the present 44 episodes is a slow one of personal growth, of making and cherishing human connections. It's a journey with simple yet powerful imagery that connected with me, and his story isn't even the most heart-wrenching. Hinata Kawamoto's school troubles in the second season, cliche as they might sound on paper, managed to hit home with me in ways that I'm not exactly comfortable with getting into. Suffice to say that this show is a masterclass in empathy, of getting the viewer to emotionally connect with characters far beyond what is usually managed by most stories in any medium. And really, that's all I need to say. Of course, there's enough characters and plot lines explored over the show's 44 episodes to warrant much longer dedicated analyses. There's also its ability to successfully juggle tones, and hell, ain't it something how, despite not knowing Jack about Shogi, I still had a great time? All in all, it's a remarkable, emotionally resonant experience that you should definitely watch, but in case you do, prepare to hurt. Season 2 of Mob Psycho 100 is just as good as, if not better than, the first. It's about a boy named Mob with psychic powers who's just trying to live a normal life and be his best self without getting drunk on power. He's the hero we really need and really don't deserve. Hell, I bet Uncle Ben was watching this guy on his iPhone and taking notes before he got shot. I... <sighs> I'm, I'm sorry. Mob is, air quotes, mentored by a flamboyant con man named Reagan who, despite appearances and despite all odds, cares deeply about Mob and somehow occasionally, maybe accidentally sometimes, acts as a sort of moral compass. He's as well dude is what I'm saying. Mob and Reagan are the emotional core of the series. Mob's efforts to better himself are admirable and it's just fun to cheer for him, and Reagan's unexpected bouts of kindness are always heartwarming. Honestly, if the whole show was just banter between them, I'd be content, but the show also has a lot more going on, some for the better, little for the worse. Like there's this whole cavalcade of side characters and an organization plotting to take over the world or some shit, and that's honestly the most basic and least interesting part of the whole show. Ya yeah, basic! It's not awful, but in comparison to Mob and Reagan's incredible chemistry and outlook, it's pretty basic. Ya yeah, basic. It's a human insult. It's devastating. You're devastated right now. Like, my favorite episode this season, and I'm pretty sure everyone's favorite episode, was the one where Mob spent the whole episode mind-melding with some girl. That episode explored and challenged Mob's ideals and then spent the whole extended finale just splurging with incredible animation all over the place. Like, I can't even begin to describe how much of a visual spectacle this episode was. It was, bar none, the single best animated episode of an animated television series I've ever seen. So much so that I can't help but wonder how this is even a TV anime. This could be the finale of a movie, it's so good, holy fuck! Uh, yeah, it's just a really good time overall. I don't have all that much deep to say about it, it's just always fun. Visually, Mob Psycho 100 is always a treat for the eyes, and Mob and Reagan are such endearing characters that they can and do carry any scene they're in. I just... Fuck, it's good, man. It's good. It's good! The Promised Neverland is a show that excellently builds tension during and across episodes and pays off that tension with climaxes of adrenaline and anxiety. It's one of those shows that tricks you into thinking it's cute and innocent before revealing its true intentions and escalating everything. The Promised Neverland is about three kids, Emma, Ray, and Norman, living at an orphanage and having a grand old time. One of their fellow kids gets adopted and accidentally leaves a stuffed rabbit behind. Emma and Norman rush out to return it, and oops! Turns out she be dead, killed by some scary-ass monster. The orphanage is actually a farm, and they're all food, and the matron is in on it. Curse your sudden but inevitable betrayal! Now they've got to plan their escape under the sinister matron's watchful eyes, and they better do it quick, 
because they're up next for adoption. Wow, that was the most back-of-the-box-ish description for anything I've ever wrote. Shoot me now. In short, this show is all about tension. These kids have to plan and prepare for a daring, probably impossible escape, including gathering supplies and training the other kids, all while not arousing suspicion. There's a constant mind game at play where the kids and the matron all have to try to figure out who knows how much, not let the others know how much they know, and plan and act accordingly. The constant balancing act of having to learn as much as possible while feigning knowing nothing becomes intense when coupled with the fact that if the kids make just one mistake, they're dead. As the show goes on, the power balance will shift, the stakes will somehow get even more intense, and a sense of inevitable dread starts to creep over everything as success and survival become increasingly less likely. To abuse some cliches, the show's twists and turns will keep you on the edge of your seat. Man, I am really phoning it in with this one. The show's ability to keep you hooked despite of, or even because of its horror, its constant and ever-growing sense of dread, is its primary appeal and success, but that's not all it has going for it. The characters, all forced to grow up too fast in a situation they should never have been forced through, are all almost inherently likable. You've got Emma, the headstrong leader who inspires the kids around her, Norman, the resourceful, clever one without whom the plan would be doomed, and Ray, the pessimistic but brave one who learns from the others how to have a little hope. While I can't say there's anything particularly groundbreaking about any of these characters, they've got just enough going on to make you want to cheer for them. You want them to live, get out, and grow up. I'd even go so far as to say that the reason I'm exciting for the upcoming second season isn't to return to the world and story structure that's been established, but to see these kids break out of their shell, grow up, and mature in... Uh, perhaps I'm saying too much. Regardless, this season worked well enough on its own, and I'm excited to see where the show goes next. This next entry I've only briefly mentioned before, but oh boy do I love it. Chihaya Furu. It's a sports anime about people sitting on the floor playing cards, and no joke, it was the second most exciting thing I watched this year. Chihaya Furu follows Chihaya Ayase, Taichi Mashima, and Arata Wataya from a young age as they get into competitive karuta, a Japanese card game, with the bulk of the show taking place in high school as Chihaya tries to be the very best like no one ever was. God, there's so much great about this show, where do I even begin? I guess let's start with the show's central sport, karuta and how it's the perfect spectator sport to base an anime around. The card game itself is built from the Ogura Hyakunin Ishu, a collection of 100 classic Japanese poems. The poems are all printed out on cards, which the players arrange in front of them. A reader reads the poems aloud, and the players have to snatch up the cards until there's none left on their side. Though it requires knowledge of Japanese and the memorization of the poems in order to be playable, the core concept being so easy to understand makes it easy to watch a match and tell how it's going without that knowledge. Like, you don't need to know the language or the poems to understand that when each player has only one card left, the players are faced with the luck of the draw, and of the few details that do stem from language, the show does a good enough job of communicating that information that you can pick up on those nuances just by paying attention, even without yourself knowing the language. For instance, Chihaya's best card, being one that starts with the word Chihaya, is something that you just need ears to understand. So whenever a reader opens their mouth and they start uttering that first syllable, you know what's happening next. Chihaya! Chihaya Furu is able to maximize Karuta's easy-to-understand nature to make a compelling sports drama with highs and lows, with underdogs and comebacks, and that's all backed up by some fairly excellent character work. 
ね、普段なっている方が多いようですけれども。Our protagonist Shihaya is eminently lovable. Her love and endless passion for the game not only drives her to constantly improve, but inspires others to do the same. You follow her through all the hard work she puts in, all of her exciting triumphs and heartbreaking defeats, and she just keeps going. So earnest in her passion that you want nothing more than to see her reach her goal. She's got to be queen, and we got to be there to see it. And there's just a whole lot more I could gush about, but I'm gonna cut myself off here. Suffice to say that despite, or perhaps even because of, being about the nichest of subject matters, Shihaya Furu is endlessly exciting and effortlessly watchable. Everyone owes it to themselves to watch it. Next, let's briefly discuss season three of Titans. Titans? Titans? Titans! I've had that meme saved. I'm so glad I finally got to use it. So, I've talked about how much I enjoy Attack on Titan before, and I don't have too much new to say, so this is gonna be brief. Season 3 continues to be excellent, a phenomenal display of tense pacing and adrenaline filled intensity. The newly emerging details about the world are serving to expand the scope of the narrative into something beyond what I had previously conceived of, making me super intrigued about where this is going next, and the slow but steady growth of the main cast. Particularly and surprisingly, Aaron and Armin is only serving to further endear me toward them. It's good, thrilling fun, and how the fuck are they supposed to wrap everything up in just one more season? The final season? Are you kidding me? Isn't the manga still ongoing? How in the world are they gonna get away with that? I don't.、Uh, uh. Another one I'll just briefly touch on. Another third season. This one of Bungo Stray Dogs. The more of this show I watch, the less I care about it. My interest in this show peaked at the start of season two, and it's very telling that those episodes were set in a different time and starred a different cast from the rest of the show. The main show is an odd series about a bunch of people with supernatural abilities, except all of the characters are named after literary figures. For instance, in season two, the main villain is F. Scott Fitzgerald. And his power is called the Great Fitzgerald, as in the Great Gatsby. So, pretty much anytime someone shows up whose book I'm read, I'd be all like, You magnificent bastard, I read your book! Interwoven are plots with detectives and mafias in the dark recesses of some city, but beyond those superficial plot elements, I'm not really sure what the show is about. It's a fun show that mostly operates on the rule of cool, but I can't say. I've gotten really attached to any element of it. Aside from this girl, she's cool.、Uh, it's just a show that's there that I watch sometimes. Oh well. Remember how earlier I said that Sangats no Lion was one of only two anime I watched this year that made me cry? This next entry is the other Carol and Tuesday. <laughs> This show is about two young women trying to pursue their passions in a world that is, at best, indifferent to their being. Tuesday is the daughter of a prominent politician who runs away after getting fed up with having no control over her life. She happens to run into Carol, a young woman who's been on her own since she was young, and they quickly bond over their shared love for music. They bond over composing and playing music together, and soon they get caught up in trying to launch a music career. In a time during which their sort of music is seen as quaint and out of fashion. You could probably guess from the opening lines of this segment, but this show really resonated with me. That's mostly down to the relatability of the two title characters. The heart of the story is a fairly simple one two young people who once felt isolated. Finding a kindred spirit in one another and trying their damnest to pursue their passions with one another. Tuesday is someone who's been controlled her whole life and just wants to make something for herself, to claim her autonomy and live her life how she sees fit, regardless of what her family would think. She admires Carol for seemingly having that very freedom, but they both learn the hard way that just being on your own in a world as harsh as theirs doesn't necessarily make one happy or even actually free. Regardless, Of their lives before, once they find each other, they're able to face the challenges ahead of them together. The world they live in may not be a fair one. 
It may be one that tries to keep them down and poor, tries to control their livelihood, or one that is really just against them, and that all sucks, but they don't have to let any of that get them down, because whatever happens, they can get through it so long as they have each other. Their relationship acts as an emotional core that carries the series, and their relationship is not just deepened through them sticking together and helping each other out, but illustrated through the songs they write write and play. For instance, the very first song they play, which recurs throughout the series and acts as the emotional climax during the performance at the end of the first half, is, well... I swear that song always makes me tear up. Like, I don't even have to hear it to get shivers. Just thinking about it as I write this is enough. So yeah, this show is brilliant, and I would highly recommend it, though I must add this disclaimer. I've only seen the first half of this show because Netflix isn't adding the other half until late in December, at which point this video will already be deep into production, and I want to watch it all right now, goddammit! Next up, we've got the fifth part of everyone's favorite wacky escapade, Jojo's Bizarre Adventure Part 5, Golden Wind. This season follows Giorno Giovanna, a young man with a dream, a dream to become a gang star. In other words, place himself at the top of the Italian mob scene so he can get illegal drugs off the street. He joins up with Bruno Bucciarati and his gang of misfits and things quickly spiral out of control. This season was a wild, fun ride. If I'm being honest, I think this is the most tightly written and paced JoJo arc since Battle Tendency. Diamond is Unbreakable might still be my favorite arc, but where that arc had a lot of downtime where it would just explore the town or hang out with the characters, Golden Wind is almost constantly blazing ahead. As soon as one fight's done, there's barely any downtime before the next one starts. This lack of downtime gives the show a fast pace and a sense of urgency, and that Golden Wind managed to consistently maintain that pace over the course of its 39 episodes is something of a miracle. It's so good at delivering this pacing that by the end you'll be shocked to learn that only a week has passed since the show's event started. No, I'm not kidding. All those fights, all those character arcs, all crammed into one week. How does that even happen? Another thing I like about this season is its focus on its ensemble cast. This season is as much about each member of Bucciarati's gang as it is about Giorno himself, who will frequently take the back seat when it's time to focus on one of the other characters. I appreciate all the time spent with the other characters because it allows us to understand the importance of each member, not just to the gang, but to each other as friends. We get to understand how a group of people from all different walks of life come together as they did and become irreplaceable friends. Their group dynamic is what really sells the show, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Plus, this season, like all others, just continues to provide endless memes, and that's always excellent. <laughs> Kiki's Delivery Service! Somehow it took me until this year to finally get around to this one, but here we are, and yep, that sure was a Ghiblizaki, alright. Th that that was a portmanteau of Ghibli and Miyazaki there. I was I was being clever! Kiki's delivery service is about Kiki. A young witch who strikes out on her own, moves into a new town, and starts her own little business, a delivery service. The film follows Kiki as she lives that life and is overall a very pleasant affair. The movie is, to the shock of absolutely no one, about Kiki growing up, about losing and then gaining back self-confidence, and learning both to be independent and the value of relying on others. Adulthood and life is a complicated affair that won't always go your way, and it's more than okay to accept a helping hand now and again. The city Kiki finds herself in at first views her as something between a curiosity and a nuisance, and it was accepting the help of a baker lady that allowed Kiki to get a real foothold in town. She arrives in town pre-packaged with her own good work ethic, motivated to be the best darn witch she can be, 
but through her interactions with the townsfolk, the baker, the painter, the old lady, Kiki learns that her hard work isn't just for her own benefit, but for the good of those around her. She's a part of a larger community now, and the services she provides mostly benefit that community, rather than just furthering her training. She faces challenges along the way, most especially a hit to her self-confidence that robs her of some of her magic ability, but eventually she's able to take pride in the knowledge that there's some things that only she can do, some ways to help the people around her that only she can manage. And she does those things and everyone wins. Happy end. It's a simple tale of budding maturity, but it's one that resonates. Kiki is an endlessly relatable protagonist, and the sublime Ghibli aesthetic will never not be brilliant. I mean, do I even need to say anything else? It's Ghibli, it's Miyazaki, it's a classic. And I really want to watch it again and just soak it all in. Yeah, that'd be great. And it was at this point in this hour-long recording session that I realized I completely neglected to write two sections dedicated to theatrically released follow-ups to two anime series that I keep up with. The Hibike Euphonium movie, Our Promise of Brand New Day, and then the Yojo Senki movie, or Saga of Tanya the Evil, the movie. So I'm just gonna insert a quick blurb about those two things right here. Uh, Yojo Senki continues to be fun, uh, kill all the kamis, magic nonsense. Tanya is hilariously evil and over the top, and it's great to follow her. She just wants a, an innocent desk job behind the front lines. It continues to be a lol-inducing time. And then the Hibike Euphonium movie. Euphonium is just overall one of my favorite anime series, just period. Honestly, it would probably be my brand if I had thought to do that earlier and uh, under the scope didn't already do that. But regardless, Kumiko continues to be just me, and Shuichi can fuck off, and the new girl in the movie sort of weirds me out, but it will, overall, it was still Hibike Euphonium, and I still loved it, so yeah. All right, moving on. Hatarak Saibo, or Cells at Work, is the breakout show from uh, last year, shit, that asks, what if Osmosis Jones, but anime? And yes, I know that's the most unoriginal comparison I could possibly make. Don't fucking at me! The question you need to ask yourself when consuming any media ostensibly about a real-world topic in a fictionalized, exaggerated manner, such as the present subject, is, did it teach me anything? In the case of cells at work, I learned that red blood cells are formed in bone marrow, so the answer to that question is yes, which means that this cartoon is a better teaching tool than the American education system. <laughs> Quips aside, Cells at Work is about the various functions of the human body if the human body was populated by anime characters living in an underground bunker in Japan, hiding from the third impact or something. So what's good about this show? Well, the opening is baller. Uh, the show's got stellar character designs, which sell a cute and fun aesthetic. Seriously, the design of the main red blood cell is just an all-time classic. Excellent work there. I enjoyed the copious amounts of blood and violence. It was a jarring and fun contrast against the otherwise cutesy aesthetic, so that was cool. I enjoyed how the episodic structure took us to various parts of the body and explored different characters and their functions, though red blood cell will always be Bay, And, uh, that's... <sighs> That's it, really. It's good and fun, and I, I just don't have any strong opinions that need saying, so I'm just gonna leave it at that. Moving on, Millennium Actress is a brilliant film that makes me feel like an idiot for not being more familiar with the work of its famed director Satoshi Kon. The man left us far too early having directed four films in one TV show, and having now seen two of those films, I feel it's no exaggeration to say that it's a tragedy that he didn't get to stick around longer and produce more. Regardless, all we can do now is celebrate the work he left behind. Millennium Actress was the second film directed by Kon, released in 2001, and I think I enjoyed this film even more than his first. Millennium Actress chronicles the life of an actress named Chiyoko. More specifically, it's framed around an interview she's giving in her twilight years as she recounts her life. She tells of not only her life as an actress, but of how she once met a man and then spent the rest of her days chasing him, never quite catching him. This seemingly simple story is made more complex through its framing. Not only does the interview structure allow interjections from the older Chiyoko and her interviewers, but because she's telling the story of both her life and her acting career through the lens of elderly reflection, things start to get 
a little jumbled. You'll be watching a scene unfold and you'll assume that that was clearly from a movie she was in and another that was probably just from her life, but then something will occur that will make you question that assumption. Was that actually from her life or from a movie? Or does that distinction even matter? The many lives this woman led seemingly blend into one, a bunch of disconnected stories strung together by a single desire, a search for one man she wants to meet just one more time. You can get lost in trying to piece together fact from fiction in the narrative of this woman's life, but regardless of what actually happened, the story she told, the one we see unfold, was without a doubt her truth. And the film, no, Chiyoko, ties together her story, her truth, all together at the very end with a closing line that perfectly encapsulates and partially recontextualizes the journey of her life, a powerful declaration that's the perfect note to close on. If you've seen the film, you know what I'm talking about, and if you haven't, you really should go and find out for yourself, because I ain't about to play it here. It's a brilliant film, and it deserves all the awards. Like, all of them. Next up is the most raw excitement pumped into a single anime from this year, the gayest hype machine that the anime industry has produced since... Well, I guess that depends on how you define hype machine. Anyway, bitches, it's Promare. Promare, to quote Crunchyroll writer and Twitter user Bobda, is about how the gays will punch global warming. And really, that's just the perfect summation right there. Honestly, do I even need to say anything else? In a world where a bunch of people suddenly have the ability to control flames, those people, called Burnish, are treated as criminals and terrorists and locked up. At the climax of the film's opening action sequence, Gallo, a firefighter, captures the leader of the Burnish, Leo, and from there tensions escalate, truths are revealed, the gays get gayer, and the hype never ends. Alright, so you know how action movies are often compared to roller coasters, right? They've got their ups and downs, the building and releasing of momentum. In a typical flick, you'll set the stage with the opening act, carefully setting up the pieces in a slow buildup that's comparable to the first hill climb at the start of a roller coaster before the action kicks off as you shoot down the hill. Well, Promare is more like a launch coaster, as in at the very start, the ride just shoots you off at 100 miles per hour and then doesn't let up until the end. Like the Hulk coaster in Universal, stretched out to almost two hours. This movie is intense action scene followed by intense action scene, each filled with kinetic animation integrated with dynamic 3D camera work with a colorful visual flair that really only Trigger could ever pull off, and it never stops being exciting or visually immersive. Like seriously, I can count four, maybe five scenes off the top of my head that don't grab you by the ass and shake you till your head's spinning. It's truly the rolleriest of coasters. I am... So sorry I said that. Aside from being an incredible hype machine and a visual spectacle, there's a plethora of story and character beats and underlying themes that resonate, from the obvious climate change metaphor to the almost as obvious brewing gay romance between Gallo and Leo, which I'm pretty sure got cheers in the theater. Between all that, there's plenty of narrative meat to suck on, so taken as a whole, Promare is pretty fucking incredible would recommend. This next anime I could never be asked to say the full name of. Its name is Lord L. Meloy II, Case Files, Rail Zeppelin, Grace Note, which, fuck that, terrible name, whoever thought of that ought to be fired. All I ever called this was the Waver Velvet Show, because that's what it was. This is the latest of many Fate spin-offs to get an animated adaptation, and the only one to garner any sort of intrigue from me because it stars Waver Velvet. And unfortunately, that's the bulk of what it has going for it. The Waver Velvet Show chronicles the life of Waver Velvet post-Fate Zero. It partially acts as a thematic follow-up to his and Iskandar's story in Fate Zero, but it's also about Waver his sidekick, not Saber, and his students solving a bunch of magic mysteries. And it's that mystery-solving part where this series stumbles, because all those mysteries are pure nonsense. This show is at its best when it's just focusing on character beats. Waver having to survive and grow in the wake of the Holy Grail War, Grey trying to find a place for herself or even discover herself. That's all good shit, but most of it is couched in these magic mysteries that just don't work. Waver over here saying who done it and why 
done it. Inherently silly words with such seriousness that I can't even think now. What is the appeal of a who done it? Figuring out the mystery, right? The clues are laid out before you, and if the mystery is couched in the real world and follows logically from the clues provided, you should have a chance to figure it out as or before the characters do. This show's mysteries, though, aren't couched in any real world logic. They're steeped in bullshit fake magic logic. So unless you're already deeply entrenched in fate lore, chances are you're going to have no idea what the fuck is going on until Waver spells it all out after he solves it. It's paced and structured like a proper mystery, but without that element of being grounded in real-world logic, us viewers are just left lost until everything's over anyway. Like I said earlier, there is stuff to like about this series with its character writing, and seeing a young Olga Marie Animusphere was just making me go, oh the whole time, but when the show's primary structure is fundamentally flawed, it becomes hard to really recommend it. I was able to enjoy it thanks to it being about Best Boy Waver, but without him, this show just wouldn't be worth it. This next show provided me with the most laughs of any anime I watched this year. Gekkan Shoujo Nozaki-kun, or Monthly Girls Nozaki-kun. It's about a girl named Chiyo Sakura who botches her love confession to a very tall boy named Umetaro Nozaki, who turns out to be a famous shoujo manga author, and she gets roped into being his assistant, and all sorts of hijinks ensue. If you've ever heard someone say they can't explain why something is funny, because comedy is subjective, then they're either lazy or a fucking liar. Uh, probably the former. All opinions on art are subjective, and if you can explain why you find one piece of art to be engaging, then you're perfectly capable of explaining why another evokes a laugh. For instance, this show. Now, I'm usually the first to balk at stupid misunderstandings being the basis for a joke, but when this show uses a silly misunderstanding as the basis for an escalating series of ridiculous and increasingly comical situations, I can't help but smile and go along with it. And then it has the balls to repeat that exact same misunderstanding, and somehow it still works. This show can take character archetypes and twist them just enough to make them hilarious, like we've got this guy who's just effortlessly charming and handsome, but actually he's just really embarrassed about it and just really wants someone to help. Please, someone help him. Is this show a work of comedic genius? It just might be. And why is there not a season two? <sighs> this show just never failed to put a smile on my face. It's got a wild cast that plays off each other super well, from reacting to gaffes to just being goofs, and all of it is couched in a sweet and earnest will-they-won't-they they, one-sided romance between the leads. Honestly, it's just a cute and fun time that you cannot go wrong with. Okay, so this year I watched a whole lot of Macross. <laughs> the original 36-episode TV series, the film reimagining titled Do You Remember Love, the movie version of Macross Plus, and the five-episode OVA Macross Zero. I don't care to dedicate an entire section to each of those, so I'm lumping them all here under one big Macross banner. And as a whole, I can't say Macross resonated with me all that much. There's plenty to appreciate about the series, don't get me wrong, and it can hit some amazing highs, just maybe it doesn't hit those highs often enough. The original Macross is about a space war. Humans versus aliens that are basically humans, but too big. The humans took a big alien spaceship that crash-landed on Earth and turned it into a giant mech that's also a city and a military base from which the humans coordinate the bulk of their anti-alien efforts, and also a new pop idol becomes famous on that mech, which is called the Macross, and the power of her music is the key to saving humanity, and you know, when I try to sum it up like that, it starts to sound pretty crazy. And in a lot of ways, it is. It somehow takes a bunch of disparate, wacky ideas and coalesces them into a single package that somehow makes sense when it's all together. Macross is at its best when it's just doing its wacky sci-fi stuff like that, but unfortunately, the show isn't all about that. It's also very interested in the love life of its protagonist, Hikaru Ichijo, which... <laughs> Look, I'm sorry, but Hikaru's just a bastard, a 
two-timing, good-for-nothing piece of absolute trash he plays around with and breaks the hearts of two women and still somehow ends up with one of them in the end just fucking no. That's one area where the film Do You Remember Love improves. Hikaru's still a bastard there, but noticeably less so. Actually, Do You Remember Love is an improvement on pretty much all fronts. The story is much tighter and better paced, fitting comfortably into the film's 115 minute runtime, and most importantly, the film is bloody gorgeous. If you only ever see one thing from the Macross franchise in your anime watching career, it should be this film. You may be missing out on some context from the TV show, but honestly, I don't think that matters too much. Then there's Macross Plus and Macross Zero, both of which can best be described as tone pieces. They're disconnected enough from the original series that they can be viewed on their own just fine, which is good because they're both better than the original series, though they're not as awe-inspiring as Do You Remember Love. Beyond being more tightly written and less frustrating, though I don't have terribly much to say about either because neither left that strong an impression on me. At least the original series gave me something to be pissed off about. There's nothing wrong with Plus or Zero, but without revisiting them and trying to dissect what themes they were going for, I couldn't tell you much else about them. I do recall that Zero got at least a little environmentalist though. So will I continue with the Macross franchise? Maybe, maybe not. All I know for certain is one thing. Fuck Harmony Gold for continuing to hold the franchise license hostage, you absolute pricks. <laughs> Alright, so next up we've got to talk about Gantz Zero, but in order to do that we have to talk about Gantz, which... Ugh. Oh, I'm gonna get roasted for this one. So a few months back, Super Eyepatch Wolf, member of the Endangered Species Good Anime YouTuber, put out a video called The Insanity of Gantz and Why You Should Care, in which he sang the praises of said manga and made it sound like a dope-ass time. Mr. Wolf did include a warning that the mangaka didn't do a very good job of writing women, but I, in my hubris, ignored that warning and proceeded to read the whole Gantz manga. And oh my fucking god, Mr. Wolf, man, you really undersold that warning because the ways in which this manga handles its women characters are completely fucking awful. Oh, I cannot even begin to count the myriad of ways in which this manga robs its female characters of their agency, treats them like props for the male characters, and sexually objectifies them to stupidly high levels. Like during the whole gigantic finale arc, one of the only sympathetic female characters is forced to run bare ass naked around an entire alien city for chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter, and it just keeps happening, and why won't it stop? It's senseless exploitation, and if any of you motherfuckers Hop in the comments all like, well, it's because she fell in the alien water that melted only closed because the aliens then A, that's a Thermian argument, you just did a Thermian argument at me, and then B, I don't remember asking you a goddamn thing. <sighs> Calm down. Me, you're not an internet shouty man. I've got notes enough to make a whole rant video about this, so leave that for then. And leave a comment if you're interested. Anyway, as part of my Gantz consumption period, I also watched the Gantz Zero CG movie on Netflix, which is an adaptation of one of the least frustrating arcs of the manga, but is still definitely 100% Gantz. The best thing I can say about this movie is that the CG animation is really cool. Aside from the ridiculous boob physics. It doesn't do that polygon pictures thing where it cuts back on details and the frame rate in order to emulate 2D animation. Instead, this movie takes advantage of its medium to show us detailed landscapes, horrific imagery, and kinetic action sequences. The story, instead of leaning into the manga's tiring nihilism, is in instead focused on the relatable plight of the only likable male character in the whole manga, Masaru Kato, who wants to both do all in his power to help others and survive to get home and look after his little brother. He's a good boy. The rest of the narrative appeal comes from the increasingly awesome and dire stakes 
following these characters as they try to survive an increasingly impossible scenario and cheering for them as they resolve to do so despite all odds. It still sidelines its female characters more than is kosher, but I guess it's not as awful as the manga, so there's that. If you're really curious about the Gantz franchise, I would honestly say that you should just watch this movie and nothing else. It's the most tolerable thing to come out of it. In conclusion, Gantz bad and I will die on that hill. And finally, the last entry on this list, the last anime I finished watching this year, was season two of the remake of Legend of the Galactic Heroes. A while back, I made a video about the first few episodes of the first season, and and I largely stand by that video. As a whole, this remake was and remains, I'd argue, a good one. Not on par with the classic OVA, but it has a flair for the dramatic that gives it an identity of its own. I'm tempted now to compare the two in terms of adaptation with a focus on how faithfulness to the source material isn't always the best route to take, but that's a topic that deserves its own video and would be a little out of place here. So it's suffice to say that this new adaptation continues to be a competent one with advantages and disadvantages over the OVA that will ultimately be up to personal preference. And with that, we shall move to the wrap up. All right, that's it. That's all the anime that I watched in 2019. So among all those which were my favorite, well, you know, I've been torturing you with my voice for long enough. So instead of just telling you what my 10 favorite were, I'll just let the anime do the talking from here. At least that was the original plan, but the ending segment of this video angers the YouTube copyright gods, but I also don't want to give up on this next ending segment, so what I'm going to do instead is upload it as a separate unlisted video and link it right uh, here so you can go watch it and I don't get the rest of the video demonetized. All right, click through to that. Thank you very much. Goodbye.